Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to this first high-level lecture of the ENGAGE project, co-organized with the America Europe Fund and the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies at KU Leuven. ENGAGE, that's the name of our project. It's of course an acronym and it stands for envisioning a new governance architecture for a global Europe. It's a Horizon 2020 project, meaning it is funded by the European Union as a scientific project, and it brings together 13 academic institutions and think tanks from across Europe in order to examine how the EU can effectively and sustainably meet the strategic challenges by harnessing all of its tools in order to become a more assertive global actor. Now that's a mouthful, no? You can check our publications and watch our previous events, which includes also a kickoff event with High Representative Josep Borrell and the former, some would say the very first High Representative, I should say the High Representative for the Common Foreign and Security Policy in the Amsterdam period, Dr. Javier Solana. You find that all on the Engage website, which is very simple, engage-eu.eu. You will also find a link um, to that website on our chat box, if you want. Let me first also say something about the America Europe Fund. We are co-organizing this event with the fund, which is hosted at the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, and which is a relatively new fund that aims at supporting academic cooperation, exchanges, programs, and research at our university, but aimed specifically at strengthening comparative knowledge of American and European societies. Now, let me turn to our webinar of today and present our high-level uh, speaker to you, Sir Robert Francis Cooper. Sir Robert Francis Cooper is a British and European diplomat and a writer on international relations and diplomacy. He served as Director General for External and Political Military Affairs at the General Secretariat of the Council of the European Union, and at the time worked with Dr. Javier Solana on all aspects of European policy, especially, I would say, the Balkans, where he also let the EU facilitate a dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina, relations with Iran, transatlantic relations, and of course, the 2003 European security strategy. Following the Treaty of Lisbon, Sir Robert was present at the creation of the European External Action Service. And he worked with the first post-Lisbon high representative, Catherine Ashton, in particular on the Balkans and on Burma, Myanmar. Between 2013 and 2014, he served as special advisor at the European Commission on precisely Burma, Myanmar. His most recent publication, which I have here in the pocket format, a little publicity does not hurt, I think, uh, it's called The Ambassador, The Ambassadors, and it looks in a very vivid prose at the personalities, the work of diplomats through the ages. And I must say, I really enjoyed reading it enormously. It makes also the case that it is people, as well as great Hegelian forces that make history. I should also mention that uh, Sir Robert's earlier book, The Breaking of Nations, was awarded the Orwell Prize for Political Writing in 2004. Now, about today's lecture's topic. This high-level lecture, in my view, could not come at a more timely moment. With geopolitical tensions rising, especially now in Eastern Europe, even with a possible outbreak of war and an invasion which President Biden has uh, called unseen on European soil since the Second World War, with all of that, the European Union is struggling to reconcile the need for a more coherent and assertive foreign policy with the varying strategic interests of its member states. And in the meantime, 
the European Union must also balance the crucial yet complex transatlantic relationship. Sir Robert brings truly unique experience and expertise, especially for the period 2002 to 2012 to us. And we are therefore very grateful for his availability. And we're very much looking forward on what he will tell us on how we should be learning from the past and how it is that everything has a transatlantic dimension. Before we turn to Sir Robert, just very quick for our audience, something about the rules of the game. This lecture in total will last for one hour. It will essentially have two parts. Uh, there will be basically two uh, sessions of 20 minutes in which Sir, Sir Robert talks to us. And between each part uh, and at the end, we will have time for Q&A with all of you. And uh, we very much look forward to you asking questions, but please put them in the chat box and then we will moderate um, the interaction with Sir Robert. Um, okay, let's get started. And may I kindly invite Robert to please take the floor. Thank you very much. Right, well, here I am. Um, uh, so I'm basically going to talk a little bit about um, uh, really my personal history um, because I'm going to describe the, the period uh, in which um, European foreign policy really began. Actually, I was involved in uh, what was then called European political cooperation uh, for some years before that. Um, but this was really a pretty um, uh, thin and um, unsatisfactory process. Uh, it consisted of, um, <clears throat> well, uh, it was dominated by a rotating presidency, um, and it even had a tiny rotating secretariat of half a dozen people or something like this. Um, uh, and um, this was okay um, when uh, occasionally the European, uh, wasn't European Union then, occasionally the, uh, the community um, made some diplomatic intervention, I think of the uh, the Venice Declaration about the Middle East, which is probably now forgotten. Um, uh, but these events were rather rare and there were long gap gaps in between. All of this changed um, in, the, in the 1990s. Um, uh, I, I should say, actually, as far as I was concerned, my life changed in the 1990s because I joined the, the British diplomatic service by accident. Um, I hadn't ever had any plans to do anything like that. And I didn't really know what diplomacy was. Um, and I joined somewhere around the uh, beginning of the 1970s. Um, and the impression I had by the early 90s that diplomacy was a rather um, um, uh, elegant form of tourism. Um, uh, but everything changed. Um, and we began with, uh, these, these, these are the years of Gorbachev um, and the fundamentals changed, the East-West relations changed. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there were two rules about uh, in the Cold War. Um, one was that Germany uh, should remain uh, divided and the other was that Yugoslavia should be united. Um, and both of those changed in the 1990s. Um, and the German... Um, the, the change in Germany was handled extremely skillfully um, uh, by, by Germany itself, um, but uh, uh, also by James Baker uh, and the USA. Um, uh, uh, but uh, with the Balkan Wars, um, uh, nobody knew what to do. Um, uh, the uh, the policy on the Balkan Wars um, is um, summed up well by uh, phrases from different generations of, of Americans. Um, uh, James Baker, uh, we don't have a dog in that fight. Um, uh, that's to say, this is not a grand strategic issue, um, not our business. Um, uh, we're not going to be involved. NATO is not going to be involved. Um, that was followed by um, 
the slogan of the first bit of the Clinton administration, um, uh, uh, lift and strike. That is to say, um, uh, lift the arms embargo so that everybody's got enough arms to kill each other. Um, and uh, then uh, if they go a bit out of hand, well, then uh, maybe we should bomb them. Um, that's to say anything but putting people in, put it, no boots on the ground. This is the, um, <coughs> this is the American um, uh, uh, history of Vietnam um, playing out and being transferred to the Balkans, um, uh, which is not appropriate. Uh, there's a big difference. Um, uh, Vietnam is several thousand miles away from the USA um, and getting as deeply involved in it as they did uh, was never a sensible policy. Um, uh, as far as Europe is concerned, uh, the Balkans was in the middle of us um, and events in the Balkans were European events um, and uh, were visible, not just, well, they were visible on our TV screens a lot of the time, um, but these are also our neighbors uh, and you cannot ignore them. Um, <coughs> so, um, uh, eventually, um, and now I'm coming towards the end of the 90s, eventually the, uh, um, the, the U.S. did get involved. Um, uh, the boots on the ground were not American. I don't think that they were ever really American. Uh, the diplomats on the ground were American sometimes. Um, uh, it wasn't that um, Richard Holbrook had any magical powers or anything. Um, uh, but it made a difference when the U.S. was involved. Um, and to demonstrate that it was the U.S. was in charge, uh, the negotiations took place at the air, at the air base in, Del in Dayton. Um, uh, <coughs> round about that time, um, it was, this is still a little bit before I, I was in Brussels, um, uh, but I did have... Um, uh, but... It was, in, it was in that time that the European Union decided it had to get a little bit more serious about foreign policy and running everything with a presidency which changed every six months um, was not a very good idea because events don't change every six months. If you want to have a negotiation or a longer term policy, you need at least to have one person who remains in place. And um, uh, at the end of the 1990s, I think it's 1999, at the European summit in Köln, um, uh, it was decided to appoint a high representative, namely Javier Solana, um, uh, not entirely coincidentally, um, the person who was NATO Secretary General um, had just been responsible for the um, uh, campaign, the, the air campaign against uh, Serbia. Um, uh, uh, I, at this time, was working um, in the Secretariat of the Cabinet in Britain, um, uh, working for Tony Blair. Um, and um, uh, there was a curious coincidence. I was not involved in the EU at the time, um, but we were thinking the same thoughts um, uh, because um, uh, it was becoming increasingly clear to us that there was a war about to take place in Macedonia. Um, we had already Serbia, uh, Croatia, uh, we'd had Bosnia, um, we'd had Kosovo, um, and uh, uh, there was extreme tension in Macedonia. And um, I ran, I used in London, I ran a Balkans committee, and I asked, <coughs> and I asked my committee at a certain point uh, three questions. One, is there going to be a war in Macedonia? Two, um, if there is one, then are we going to end up getting involved? And three, um, is there anything we can do? Um, uh, 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 well, actually what we did was we, and I should say that at this stage, um, because there's always a transatlantic dimension, even when the US isn't there, um, that uh, George W. Bush has just become president um, and has decided that the Balkans is not for the USA. Uh, they're going to deal with uh, uh, bigger things like the axis of evil and stuff like that. Um, and the Balkans was for Europeans. Um, uh, and 
so the UK, uh, uh, out of my three questions on the Balkans, my committee said, yes, there is going to be a war. Um, yes, we are going to end up getting involved. Um, yes, uh, maybe we can try to do something to prevent it. Um, and we proposed uh, that NATO send a small force there. Um, actually, at the same time, in the other side of Brussels, um, Javier Solana had just arrived uh, and was asked um, by the European foreign ministers uh, to go himself to the Balkans. So by a happy accident, we had a terrific piece of um, EU-NATO cooperation um, with NATO providing the background of a um, it, this was a very small force. Force is almost the wrong term. But the point was that there were some people with uniforms and guns and the word NATO written all over them, uh, appearing in the Balkans um, at the same time as, as Javier uh, was there um, uh, with a tiny little team um, attempting to see if a negotiated settlement could be found between the um, Albanian community and the um, uh, uh, and the, I don't know quite what you call it, well, and the Macedonian community, the, uh, and the Slav community. Um, uh, the, um, well, if, um, if you haven't heard of the war in Macedonia, um, the answer is it didn't take place. Um, uh, and um, uh, everyone has forgotten about it. Um, I think that actually this was, uh, uh, I think this was something of a success. Um, uh, I once had a look at Tony Blair's memoirs, um, which are all about the war in Iraq, explaining why um, uh, he was making what seemed at the time the right decision. He didn't, doesn't mention Macedonia once uh, because it does, didn't happen. Um, and that's what you call a foreign policy success. Um, uh, but this was a... Um, uh, this was, in the end, this was a wholly European effort. Um, uh, actually, um, and as I said, it was American policy at the time not to be involved uh, in Balkan events. And um, uh, uh, what I do remember is that I actually got a call from the, somebody I knew in National Security Council saying, um, <clears throat> uh, essentially saying, well done. Um, uh, you know, you... You did it, you saved us a lot of trouble. Um, doesn't happen very often. Um, uh, uh, then we, um, uh, but then we move on and I myself then go to, I then go to Brussels myself. Um, uh, all kinds of things are, are, now, are now happening. Um, uh, <coughs> um, uh, Afghanistan has been taken over by uh, uh, by the West, by the USA, uh, but with a large European contingent arriving there at the same time. Um, and, um, uh, but the big event that is going on uh, is now the Iraq war. And um, uh, this was, um, uh, just as the Macedonian war was a kind of, um, was a non-event because there was no war, um, the uh, the Iraq war, um, Iraq too, that is, um, was a non-event in the European Union uh, because it was never discussed. Um, uh, there was no policy at all. Uh, I guess uh, because the um, quarrel between uh, the UK and France on the subject of Iraq uh, was too strong. Um, uh, and nobody wanted to discuss it because they knew there would never be a, uh, a consensus on the subject. Um, I, I ought to mention, um, this, this is Chirac in, in France at the time, I ought to mention that Chirac played a very important role in the Balkans because um, it was after uh, European peacekeepers had been taken hostage, chained to bridges uh, and uh, things like that, that um, Chirac said, uh, um, I am not going to have French soldiers treated like this. Uh, and out of that came the uh, British, uh, British, French, Dutch uh, rapid reaction force in the Balkans. Again, don't read much about this in the history books, um, 
but uh, in those days, artillery was a lot more useful than, uh, than bombing. Um, uh, this was one of the things that played a very important role in, in Bosnia. Um, uh, curiously, actually, under UN, this was a UN force, um, except that um, uh, thanks uh, at least partly to Jacques Chirac, um, we had negotiated that um, the military decisions would be taken on the ground and not in New York. Um, uh, the, and that was, really, that was really the background to the, to the settlement in, in Bosnia. Um, but coming back to, to the Gulf War, um, uh, the war which was never discussed in Europe. Um, uh, uh, I, I actually left, I left then uh, 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 London, went to Brussels, thinking to myself, um, uh, well, um, uh, thank God for this. I'm missing out, uh, I'm missing out on this um, uh, predictably disastrous uh, war. Um, uh, and, and Europe missed out on it altogether. As I say, it was never discussed. Um, there was never what you could call a European policy on Iraq. Um, uh, 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 and so in that sense, um, it, there, was a, there was a big European failure. Um, uh, but, and the split in, in the division in Europe between those who were um, involved in Iraq and those who were not uh, was very visible. Um, I have a, a vivid memory of a European Council meeting at which the President of the Council, the last item on the agenda at the end of the day, um, President of the Council said, well, um, uh, now we have to talk about Iraq, a very important item. Um, uh, I know that different countries have different positions, but we do need to discuss it. And then there was a dead silence. Um, and after about uh, three or four minutes of silence, um, some of the um, heads of government got up and wandered around the room. Um, and then if you looked a few minutes later, you found that two groups had gathered, um, those who'd sent forces to Iraq and those who hadn't, different ends of the room. And there was no discussion at all. Um, uh, fortunately, um, because this is the European Union, when they met again the next day, uh, Iraq was no longer on the agenda, um, and they were going to discuss the question of whether countries who had exceeded their milk quotas should pay fines or not. And then the people who hadn't been speaking to each other about Iraq um, were shoulder to shoulder to stop the Italians getting away with uh, not paying their fines, Italians and Belgians, I think, too. Um, but I was actually quite struck by this, and it's always remained with me because I thought this represented a kind of, this is a fundamental strength of the European Union. Uh, if you have a wide range of subjects, if you can't agree about something, there's always something else that you have to do together. Um, the, um, uh, uh, but the fact was that the Gulf War still left Europe in foreign policy terms, um, uh, divided and uh, unaffected. Um, and um, uh, out of this, two things came. This is really the origin of um, what is called the European security strategy, the, the 203 version. I don't know whether this really amounts to a strategy or not, um, but this was a sort of an attempt to survey the field of foreign relations and to say, um, this is what we're interested in, this is the direction we want to go to. If there's a slogan attached to it, um, uh, the slogan was effective multilateralism. Um, we want multilateralism, but we want it to be real, not just talk, but actually action. Um, and uh, the second thing that came out of it um, was, um, in a sense, um, effective multilateralism in practice. Um, and that was um, uh, the beginnings of the negotiation with Iran. Um, now, this is a long, this is a long time ago, and the Iran negotiations have had, had a long, slow up, um, uh, producing the JCPOA, um, actually really significant. 
um, agreement and achievement, um, bringing in, this began with, um, it actually began with France and Germany. Uh, that became Britain, France and Germany, the E3. Um, was the EU involved? The answer is um, not certainly at the beginning, it was not discussed at all. Actually, Javier came to me one morning and said, what's all this? And shoved a copy of the Financial Times at me, um, which showed that the foreign ministers of Britain, France and Germany were off on a joint visit to Tehran, uh, about which we knew absolutely nothing. But in due course, um, this ceased to be just Britain, France and Germany, and became Britain, France, and Germany, plus uh, the European Union in the shape of Javier Solana himself. Um, uh, uh, the E3, or the E3 plus one, um, uh, who then attempted to expand it to bring in other members of the Security Council. Um, and even by the end of the George W. Bush administration, um, uh, the US, uh, um, uh, participated as an observer rather than an active participant. But this was actually, in the end, it was about um, uh, persuading the US to have uh, a more sensible policy on Iran um, uh, and bringing the P5 together. And eventually the result of that um, was JCPOA um, and uh, <coughs> the IAEA and the UN were both involved. Um, and that was, if you wanted to say so, that was um, effective multilateralism uh, actually in practice, uh, operating not through a coalition of the willing, but through international multilateral institutions. Um, so that's a fantastically um, uh, a compressed account of about 10 years, roughly. Um, uh, but that's that's where I'm going to uh, stop for a moment or two. If anybody's had time to think and write a question, then I'll ask it. Oh, I'll try. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. We don't really have um, uh, a great number of questions uh, until now. Um, <clears throat> we had a comment um, uh, uh, with one of our participants who said that she thinks the EU diplomacy failed with the former Yugoslavia. Um, <clears throat> um, but uh, that, that's more a, a comment than a, than a real uh, a question. Uh, from what you have been telling us, it's a fascinating story, of course, which uh, shows your deep uh, insight and, and, and involvement in, in all these processes. Could, could I maybe ask you to, to dwell a little bit on the European security strategy? Um, and the, the, the way in which, in a way, Europe bounced back. I do remember from that Anus Horribilis, uh, which is a bit the way we describe 2003 uh, for, for not just Europe, but also for global governance, um, because both Europe was divided, but also the Security Council, for instance, was divided. But the process leading to the Euro European security strategy, I do remember that there was a draft that was already presented at the June 2003 European right. Council. And then in December of that year, you had more or less the final adoption um, and, and the European Council itself basically taking over that beautiful language about effective multilateralism, which in fact became a big hit and hype eh, because I remember also the Belgian foreign ministry suddenly starting to talk in terms of effective multilateralism. So it became really, uh, a, really a, a great uh, hit. So, but uh, I do remember in 2003 speaking with Carl Bildt, for instance, that is, mm. you know, um, where is Solana? Yeah, because in March you had all those great divisions and Bildt said, yeah, Solana has disappeared. What's he doing? And later on, we would then discover, well, there was basically a document being prepared. And so the EU was reappearing. But you must have been very intimately involved in that period. Uh, so how, how did it all go? And what was the idea? And, and, and how did it go in those two stages, June and then December of that year? Oh, well, um, I mean, all I, I, have a, I have a memory of actually spending a weekend putting the putting the draft together. Um, but 
uh, there were before that and after that there were a se- there were a series of discussions. The discussions to begin with were were mainly in the um, in the, the small team around Solana, um, Christoph Hoisken and me, I guess. But then there were there were others, Peter Fife, who had actually been involved in um, in Macedonia on behalf of NATO, um, uh, Claude France Arnoux, um, uh, uh, myself, uh, Javier, and uh, so on. Anyway, I remember the, there was a, a rather sort of limited group that discussed this and. Um, uh, I put the draft together over a weekend. Um, I had a look at it, and actually, it's okay. It's quite nicely written, and so on. But the um, uh, but the real point was, uh, it was a document that um, uh, it was a document where it didn't say anything dramatically original. Um, but it did represent a collective uh, a collective view of how we should handle. Uh, crises, um, and um, uh, but the the reality of the effect of multilateralism, I thought, was well demonstrated um, in the approach to Iran, um, which was not a uh, which was not a coalition of the willing led by uh, the USA. Um, the USA was, of course, uh, uh, vital and present um, in the in the important stages of the Iran negotiations, um, but it was, uh, uh, this was um, the P5 plus one, the one being Germany. So this was the, the, um, uh, the E3 um, plus um, uh, Russia, China, and the USA. Um, and it was a, uh, this was a, a forum which was useful also because um, when we disagreed with other things uh, with Russia, uh, there was still a place where we were working with and cooperating with Russia. Um, uh, so, anyway, it was. Thank you so much. I have two uh, interesting questions now, um, and one comes from one of our European Studies students, who thanks you for your interesting and in- insightful contribution. And concerning the EU's involvement in the Balkans, he asks how you would relate the role of Javier Solana as high representative in that region to the roles played by Lord Carrington and Lord Owen, respectively, as representatives during the Balkan Wars uh, earlier on. Um, and, And to what extent would, for instance, Lord Carrington's and Lord Owen's efforts have impacted Javier Solana's interpretation of his role um, in the Balkans? That's one question. The other question that um, just came in is, um, of course, very much um, a topical question. That is uh, whether you think that we can and should continue to defend the Dayton Peace Agreement with its strict ethnic division of powers um, would a more democratic setup destroy Bosnia? That's the way in which the question is, is formulated. Last but not least, something that just pops in is one of our um, participants asking uh, about the role of the United States in the internal del- deliberations within the EU foreign policy making in general. So that goes way beyond the Balkans uh, story. So these are the first three uh, big questions coming your way. Well, I ask, I ask the, I'll answer them. Um, uh, Lord Carrington, David Owen, um, these were um, these were chosen as I'm not quite sure what their titles were, but they were sort of chosen as coordinator or something or other of dealing with Bosnia essentially. Um, uh, uh, what was their relationship to the High Representative? Um, I, I. Um, I mean, I'm sure they were on good terms, but essentially um, uh, they were dealing with, with, with Bosnia. Um, and Bosnia, the, the Bosnian conflict started a long time before Javier was involved, uh, or was, was while he was Secretary General of NATO, in fact. Um, and um, uh, so if they had contact with him then, it was, um, uh, it was in that capacity. Um, 
but they were dealing with um, uh, extremely um, intricate negotiations, village by village, about borders in Bosnia. Um, and I actually once at some point saw some documents about this. The names of the places everybody has forgotten. Uh, the, the work was so uh, um, was was done in such detail. Um, uh, the, de the problem then um, was solved in Dayton, um, uh, but um, <clears throat> this was an American event more than a European event. Um, uh, uh, was the um, what about um, and, and therefore I associate uh, the arrival of Solana. I associate rather with with Macedonia. Um, uh, which was um, which was the war that didn't happen. And there, the negotiator was Javier Solana with his team, uh, but I should say that George Robertson uh, played a role as well as NATO Secretary General, um, uh, and it was extremely useful uh, just to have the NATO presence available there. Um, uh, the um, what about U.S. involvement in um, in day to day uh, European business? Um, the answer is um, uh, the U.S. always knows what's going on. Um, uh, and I have, one, um, I have one memory. I can't even remember what the subject is. Um, but what I do remember, at some point or other, there was a slightly tense discussion going on in the Political and Security Committee about something. Um, and one of the people working for me came up to me um, and said, um, uh, excuse me, I've got the um, US embassy on the line. Um, they're asking um, if we're having trouble with the, and may I omit the name, with the ex delegation. Um, uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, I said, yes, tell them they're right. We are having trouble with X. Um, uh, can they possibly help us? And whoever it was, they fixed it in the next half hour. So the US is not in the room, um, but it always knows what's going on. Um, and if you want things done, there's nothing like having the US on your side. Thank you. Um, not a complete answer, but. Uh, no, thank you. I mean, I have three other questions. Would you mind if I yeah. um, ask them? Um, one is, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, um, a colleague who. Uh, was a little bit, um, <clears throat> let's say, frowning when she read the Flemish newspapers this morning, writing about Biden talking with Qatar about Europe's energy supply. So are the same mistakes happening again today? Where is Europe in that discussion? That's the first question. Then there is a question uh, by somebody who says she once interviewed you in Brussels for her research. And you, since you made this beautiful statement referring to diplomacy as an elegant form of tourism, uh, in that context, what do you make of celebrity diplomacy as an alternative form of agency for diplomats to attract attention to or to legitimize their work from amongst the general public? Thinking in particular of Tony Blair when he was the Middle East envoy between brackets. Um, that's how it is written. Um, and then last but not least, a question about the current uh, four-way talks on Ukraine border tensions. Do you consider that to be a form of effective multilateralism? Well, um, that's quite a lot of questions. The, yes. um, uh, the, the effective bit you can only discover afterwards. Um, what I, what I did want to say, I did want to um, actually remind uh, everybody um, how extremely amateurish the EU was in the 1990s before the, uh, when we, um, does anybody remember the, um, uh, the EU monitoring mission in Bosnia um, uh, who wore um, white um, garments and were known as the ice cream men? Um, uh, uh, actually, they did, they did, within their limits, they did a good job in the sense that when they arrived, things tended to quieten down. Um, uh, 
uh, and that there were outside observers made a difference. Um, uh, but um, there was no organization in Brussels that could provide support. Um, there wasn't even a budget for this. Uh, there wasn't any kind of committee or anything like this. This was all improvised. Um, uh, so this was, uh, it was an extremely amateur production. Um, um, the second term that caught my, uh, that sticks in the memory from this number of questions you, uh, you asked, uh, you, Jan, was um, celebrity diplomacy. Um, I, the name that this comes to my mind was Angelina Jolie, who was, I think, um, involved, maybe still involved, um, in the question of women in conflict situations. Um, and all I remember is that um, when we were in New York one year, um, uh, the question was not whether you could um, uh, get a meeting with the president of the USA, it was whether you could have a meeting with Angelina Jolie. So I think that celebrities can actually play uh, quite a useful role um, because if you're, um, if you're that well known, you can open any doors and get in anywhere. And if you are, um, um, uh, and if there is a sensible message and it's backed up by some um, kind of everyday, uh, everyday dipl diplomats who can actually turn the high level message into some action, um, uh, you can sometimes get results. Um, and actually I think quite a lot has been done uh, in the area of, um, of, uh, of, of women in war situations. So um, it's not a bad way. Thank you. Uh, I have another question, but maybe it's time to go for the Probably second half. We want a part two. Yes, okay. we, we need part two. So I'll, um, uh, so I run, um, I was going to, the really three things I was going to say something about. Um, one, the, um, I wanted briefly to mention that in this period that I'm talking about, um, the Convention on the Future of Europe was also going on. Um, and these, and there were some quite, um, uh, and some quite important discussions. It was actually the, um, the Convention on the Future of Europe that it did a number of things. It, it redefined quali qualified majority voting, for example, um, but it created um, the high representative as the job exists now, um, and also uh, the European External Action Service. So in terms of foreign policy, um, it was really a very significant event indeed. Um, uh, it was all rather to the, to the chagrin of, um, of Javier. Um, it, was, it was exactly the position that he would have loved to have. Um, um, uh, but um, he was the uh, uh, he was the last person before this uh, became real. Um, uh, the particular problem um, that Javier always had, um, if you ask what was the most difficult and important relationship he had uh, as high representative, the answer was it was the relationship with the rotating presidency. Um, because the meetings of the Foreign Affairs Council, and so with that, all of the uh, committees and things, um, were until then chaired by the rotating presidency. And there were lots of presidencies which did an extremely good job. Um, uh, however, if you're going to have a negotiation which is going to last more than six months, um, then you need to have one person in charge of it, and that belonged to the high representative. Um, nevertheless, um, he was not chairing the meeting. Um, and chairing the meeting is quite important when you've got 20-something uh, people around the table um, and you want to reach an agreement. Um, the position of the chair is critical and um, uh, it needs the chair to bring people together and to provide a direction for the whole thing. Um, and um, uh, uh, so at any rate, there was always a tension between the rotating presidency and the high representative. Um, uh, and I believe that the, I think the machinery that we have now, um, which combines the, the national and the European, um, uh, when it works, 
uh, uh, can be fantastic. Um, uh, the, um, when the commission is really behind you um, and they're putting um, every effort they can into providing funds for something and providing staff for it, uh, uh, and when you've got um, all of the diplomatic services of the uh, European Union, uh, this is really a very powerful machine. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, and, and so the eventually eventually it went into the Lisbon Treaty, um, uh, but this was actually this was the long term response to the Balkans and to the lack of an effective foreign policy machine. Um, uh, the um, uh, I have one particular um, uh, memory of it, um, which is when the um, um, when it was called the European Constitution initially, I think, um, uh, when that was um, rejected in a referendum by first by the Netherlands uh, and then by France. Um, what I remember is um, by accident, um, the result of the French referendum came through um, when I was, in, um, uh, I was in Washington with Javier. And, um, uh, the reaction of, uh, and I think it must have come through when we were in a, some kind of informal meeting with the president, um, because I remember uh, George W. Bush, as it still was, um, uh, uh, saying, well, what are we going to do then? Um, and uh, in particular, um, what are we going to do about Ukraine? Now, uh, exactly why he associated um, the Convention on the Future of Europe with Ukraine, I don't know. Um, but that was, that was the question he asked. Um, I have an, an ominous feeling that um, it was out of the fact that the possibility of a European answer to that question, he seemed to believe at any rate, had disappeared with the French referendum. It may have been that he invented an American answer to the question of what are we going to do with Ukraine. And this became the um, statement at the end of the Bucharest summit, which um, uh, uh, which I don't think was a very good idea. Um, if somebody wants to uh, join NATO, well, there's a process for that, and you, I, I can't remember actually what it's called, um, uh, but there's a there's a there's a sort of there's a preliminary. I mean, you do partnership for peace first, and then. As a, and then there's a sort of pathway towards becoming a member of NATO. Um, and if you're serious about enlarging NATO, what you do is you invite people to join that process. Um, whereas the Bucharest summit just came up with a statement saying that um, uh, uh, Georgia and Ukraine would become members of NATO. It didn't say when and didn't say how. Um, it just announced that it would happen. Um, uh, this doesn't strike me as being, this was a rather, um, this was a clumsy compromise um, uh, in what was a divided NATO at the time. Um, uh, and it didn't do any good um, because a year later there was a war in Georgia uh, and seven years later uh, there was um, uh, an invasion of Ukraine. Um, uh, so, um, well, I mentioned that because the subject is topical at the moment. And that, was, uh, and that was where it began. I'm not blaming the European Convention or the French referendum for this, but it still sticks in my mind that um, uh, this was on George W's mind um, uh, at that time. And it was, and, uh, it was he actually who proposed that Ukraine be invited to join NATO, which uh, certainly seemed to me to be um, going a bit too fast and too far at that particular time. Um, and then I will, um, I've mentioned just one other thing that um, uh, this is really, this is at the, this is at the end of, of uh, Javier's uh, time in Washington. This is the last of the, um, last of the Balkan Wars <coughs> um, uh, was the Kosovo uh, War. Um, that was, um, uh, that was, uh, uh, 1999, um, when Javier was still Secretary General of NATO. 
and the bombing took place. Um, but in 2008, um, uh, just after Javier had, um, had uh, retired and um, Captain Ashton had taken place, uh, had arrived, um, the um, uh, uh, Kosovo declared itself independent unilaterally. Um, and um, uh, the Serbs, um, I think, intelligently um, uh, proposed to take this to the uh, International Court of Justice. And they did this by um, putting a resolution to the General Assembly of the UN in um, the autumn of 2008, um, uh, uh, asking for an opinion of the International Court of Justice on the legality of Kosovo's declaration of independence. Um, um, uh, we, perhaps um, foolishly, when I say we, I mean the West generally led in this case by the USA, opposed this. Actually, I think it was a sensible thing for the Serbs to do because Serbia has just, um, out of the Kosovo war, um, it, uh, it found itself, it, it lost a big piece of territory. Um, and um, uh, if you're a Serb government, you've got to be able to answer the question, what are you doing about this? And um, uh, you want to have an alternative answer to, uh, we're going to have a war. Um, the alternative answer is, um, answer put forward by Boris Tadic is, I've taken to this to the world's highest judicial authority. Um, uh, and I think that was basically a good way to handle it on the part of the Serbs. Um, and um, uh, it was a pity in a way that we, um, uh, that we didn't uh, recognize that. Um, uh, what we did do um, was after a negotiation in the political and security committee, which lasted for about seven hours, um, we, uh, we made a very short EU statement um, when the Serbs, uh, when, the, um, when the ICJ kind of produced its, its report, saying that we um, took note of the ICJ opinion um, uh, and um, stood ready to um, uh, promote a dialogue between uh, uh, Belgrade and Pristina um, with a view, and I can't remember exactly what it said, but with a view to um, uh, uh, with a view to finding practical ways of um, uh, improving the lives of the citizens in the two countries. I forget what the language was, but it was it was highly neutral on the question of recognition because um, uh, five members of the EU uh, didn't then and still don't recognize Kosovo. Um, but it was also, but it was an offer of mediation by the, uh, by the EU, which was subsequently taken up. So that was the end of, uh, I think I've come to the end of my time pretty much as well. But that was for me, that was the kind of, that was the last event. This is now the beginning of the, the full high representative um, role um, uh, with uh, Kathy Ashton and the beginning of the EAS as well. So it was an eventful, um, an eventful period, um, and uh, in the end, not an unsuccessful one either. Thank you, thank you so much for this fascinating second part as well. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, would you allow me to to just read from them? Uh, two questions come from um, members of our uh, Engage um, consortium. One comes from our colleague Monica Sus who asks, how would you assess the role of the current high representative in the ongoing negotiations between the West and Russia? There is a lot of talk about Mr. Borrell's passivity, but Monica wonders how much more active Mr. Borrell can actually be with so much disagreement between the member states uh, on uh, Russia. Um, shall I read the other questions as well, or shall we take them one by one? Uh uh, no, give me the others, because then I can choose the one that I know the answer to. <laughs> Good. That was a question by Monica. We have a question from our 
say, Esade based colleague Marie van den Driessen, who asks, well, returning to this question of effective multilateralism, uh, she, she rightly observes that the landscape of global governance today is very different from 2003 when the European security strategy was formulated. And the question is, could you elaborate on how the European Union could and should pursue its objective of effective multilateralism given today's uh, landscape? Um, and then there is a question by uh, 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 somebody you must know from uh, your diplomatic career, Ambassador Jan Graus, who is also oh, yeah. one of our uh, faithful attendees uh, oh, yeah. of, of our events. He says hello to you. And he asks you the question whether there is a future for closer cooperation on foreign policy between the EU and the UK after Brexit. So, um, the just first of all, a word on the a word on the high representative. Um, everybody, I mean, all high representatives are different. These are, these are as all diplomats are different. There's a um, there are different personalities, there are different backgrounds. Um, uh, the, um, the first job of the high representative, and in the end, I think the most important job of the high representative is as chair of the, the chair of the council. Um, uh, because um, if he has any authority, um, it's because there is a consensus in the council behind him. And his first job is to bring the council together. Um, and to find the path um, uh, to some kind of um, uh, um, constructive approach to the problem. I would say as much as effective multilateralism, constructive multilateralism, not multilateral meetings uh, where everybody talks and nothing is agreed, but actually where you begin to reach agreement. The beginning of that is actually in the council. Um, and the first, uh, the position of the chair is, is actually an important position and it's quite a powerful position when you've got 23 member states, but you do need to have, um, the chair needs to find solutions with the member states to talk to them all and so on. But that, that is the, um, um, somebody who is, a, who is a good chair of the meeting, who listens to people, knows how to solve their problems together. Um, uh, that's where you get your authority from. As the, uh, as, as the high representative. That's where it all begins, actually, with the Dean of the Council. The, um, um, uh, um, and then, I forget what the middle question was, but the Jan Graal's question, and if I say hello to him as well, which goes a long way back. Um, uh, the um, uh, 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 cooperation with the UK Yes, well, I think the UK is being rather difficult at the moment, um, and it can only get better. Um, but meanwhile, um, everyone is um, uh, in Europe consumed with the question of Partygate and how Boris Johnson celebrated his birthday uh, and so on. So, um, uh, but um, uh, these, uh, these times will pass. Um, and... Um, uh, of course, um, uh, geography uh, hasn't changed, um, uh, and uh, interests haven't changed, and the UK still has enormous interests in common uh, with the EU. Um, and uh, we do need very badly to, um, uh, to get our act together on this. Um, I, I don't know exactly how. Um, I must say, having been at um, uh, any number of um, EU meetings with um, third country partners, um, uh, they were mostly uh, dull and frequently useless. Um, and um, uh, I think that some way of working, um, uh, okay, it needs a formal framework, but what matters is what goes with the formal framework, and that's the informal. Um, uh, communications and uh, the informal commitment. Um, no, I think that, um, uh, well, but I mean, I would think this, so, and, and I'm not the government. Um, I think 
the uh, more closely that uh, uh, Britain can work with the EU, um, the better for both sides. Um, exactly how you do that, um, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I've said in the past, well, what really matters um, is usually not what happens at the meetings, but what happens after the meetings, um, because everybody stated their position. Um, it's the, it's the conversation that really matters. And that's why Zoom is no good for meetings. Uh, the conversation that really matters is the one that takes place in the corridors afterwards, uh, when you say, well, what I really meant was so-and-so to the people. So my, um, I think the ideal scenario for the UK is that um, uh, there is some kind of minimal informal agreement, um, and then you um, have a special arrangement with the UK, with their diplomatic mission in Brussels um, gets a pass which allows them into the bar. Um, because it's not, as I say, what happens in the meeting that matters. It's what it's the informal conversations after. So I think that um, uh, uh, we, we must in due course have some kind of um, uh, formal agreements, um, but uh, we must reestablish the informal connections. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will um, go back to the question asked by Marie van den Driesen, which is indeed about uh, effective multilateralism uh, being uh, the, the difference uh, from the era of 2003 with the European security strategy and the question how the EU could and should pursue this effective multilateralism objective given today's um, different uh, landscape. Um, that was Marie's question. Now there is another question, if I may, which is fairly interesting and uh, because you spoke about the importance of chairing meetings and coordinating in foreign policy, uh, when you mentioned the position and the role of the high representative, the post-Lisbon one, the Lisbon Treaty has of course also introduced another new function, which is the permanent president of the European Council, uh, currently uh, Mr. Charles Michel, as yeah. in that function. How do you assess the relation between the holders of those uh, positions, uh, the, the high rep and uh, the European Council president, basically the times of Catherine Ashton, uh, Herman van Rompuy, then going to uh, Federica Mogherini, uh, uh, Donald Tusk, and, and today's uh, situation with Mr. Borrell and Mr. Michel. How do you see that relationship? Thank you. Well, the, um, uh, I mean, if the, um, if the council agrees on something, um, uh, then the high rep has a policy, then, you know, if Europe has a policy, um, then the high rep's important. Um, if Europe doesn't have a policy, doesn't agree, um, then the high rep is absolutely nothing. Um, and that's really it. Um, the, uh, but um, uh, I also think in this of the, um, uh, I also thought that somehow or other we, um, that the Iran negotiations were organized, uh, were organized quite well. I thought that the, uh, the role that Javier and then Kathy Ashton played in negotiations with Iran was a kind of example of, um, of, of how it can be done. Um, and um, the fact that it was not just Britain, it was not Britain, France and Germany, um, but it was Britain, France and Germany plus uh, high representative, who actually um, almost always um, acted as the spokesman for Britain, France and Germany, um, even when, when uh, the, uh, in the negotiations with, with Iran and with the, with the rest of the, of the P5 as well. Um, uh, uh, but that's a, um, but if you're doing something, um, uh, a negotiation like the Iran negotiations, um, uh, it takes over your life completely. Um, uh, and you can't do that if you're the, um, if you're the president of the European Council. Um, uh, well, you can appear from time to time and um, show that you've got the backing of the heads of state and government. Um, but if the high rep is any good, uh, he or she has got the backing of the, of the heads of state and government. Um, but if you're going to deal with um, 
uh, with detailed questions, whether it's about between Serbia and Kosovo, or whether it's about the details of a nuclear agreement with Iran. That's a full-time job. Um, so it's useful to have the authority of the heads of government as well. But, but real agreements uh, require real detail. Um, and um, uh, uh, so I think the high rep is indispensable. I think it's a, I think it's an extremely important job. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, we ought always to get the best person that you, we possibly can. I, I don't see why um, it shouldn't be somebody who's been a head of government themselves earlier, um, uh, uh, because you'll be dealing at least part of the time with other heads of government. But I think the president of the European Council has got quite a lot to do in making this gigantic machinery um, function well politically as well as bureaucratically. Um, uh, I think the high rep has actually got a gigantic job as well. Thank you so much. We are more or less approaching the end of, um, of this webinar. Um, Sir Robert, can I still ask you one question? It's about yes, your please. it's about your book on the, the ambassadors, eh? yeah. um, and you write in the beginning of your book. Well, uh, you wonder for yourself who is my favorite diplomat, and you write probably it's Talleyrand, but uh, there are so many fascinating characters in your book, uh, going from Machiavelli to Richelieu to Mazarin to people like Jean Monnet to Henry Kissinger. So, yes. after all, who is your favorite diplomat? Who should we look at as our model? Well, um, the answer then is, I think that you need, um, um, I mean, I, I, um, I, I mean, Talleyrand is uh, somebody that, um, uh, Talleyrand is fascinating and is a fantastically brilliant person. Um, uh, for most of his life, he was ineffective because he was um, working for masters that he didn't that you do really didn't agree with, either Napoleon um, or uh, Louis XVIII, um, who, to whom he gave extremely good advice, both of them, but none of them took the advice. Um, I, I also think, I mean, high on my list actually is Jean Monnet. Um, and I call the chapter on Jean Monnet, the practical imagination, because I think of, I think actually of imagination as being really important quality for diplomats. Um, able to understand other people, a sort of empathetic imagination to understand how it looks from their point of view, but also imagination to find new ways to solutions, which is what Monet did uh, in a highly original fashion. But then in other situations, if I wanted to name another person in the book that I admire very much, um, it's the Swedish, he was, uh, um, he was ambassador in Moscow, he was prime minister, he was president at one point, um, uh, Yuho Pasiki, um, dealing in entirely different uh, circumstances. Um, I also found him extremely admirable. Um, so um, um, I, um, you know, I like stories on the whole with happy endings. So I've written about the people that I like. Um, but actually, I like them all in one way or another when I read one chapter, I would think, yes, actually, he was fantastic. Um, so, uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, uh, dear Robert, thank you so much. I, on behalf of all of us, we would like to thank you for this really great and very fascinating uh, lecture, and not just a lecture, a great um, uh, open exchange with you. I would like to thank our audience also for asking such pertinent questions. I would like to tell all of you, please stay tuned with the Engage project, stay tuned with the work of our America Europe Fund and our Leuven Center for Global Governance um, Studies. There will definitely be other high level lectures, other uh, webinars. There will even be uh, a perspective of a physical event. I want to point out that on the 21st of April, we will organize a physical event, namely the final conference of our Reconnect project, which is about reconciling European citizens with uh, Europe through the rule of law. 
and uh, democracy. So that's going to be in the Fondation Universitaire on the 21st of April. But before that, we will still have workshops with our colleagues in Madrid and in Prague. So just if you're also interested in rule of law and democracy uh, uh, matters. So again, thank you so much, uh, Robert. And uh, again, uh, it's been a great privilege to engage with you. We uh, want to stay tuned with all of you and wish you a very, very good day. All the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you.